Well, let me, uh, uh, let, 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 let me begin. First of all, I want to thank, thank you for inviting me here. Um, uh, is, uh, it's, I'm honored to, to be, um, I was honored to receive this invitation and uh, thank you for having me. And as I've learned more about your organization, uh, I've uh, been more, ever more deeply impressed. I should say that Norval Morris, um, I, I've known for, well, I knew for, for, for decades and he is one of my uh, uh, heroes and so it, it was, I was, it was delighted to hear of, uh, that he was, had been one of your past presidents. Speak into the microphone. Okay, okay, okay. Well, let me, uh, uh, as, we, as we're fiddling, uh, as you can see, I'm technologically challenged. Uh, this, is a, uh, a, this, this is a graph of the, uh, the US, the imprisonment rate in the United States, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but it, it bears repeating. Um, uh, for more than 50 years, the imp imprisonment rates in the United States from the 20s through the early 70s uh, hovered around about 100 per 100,000. Beginning in 1973, imprisonment rates began increasing in the United States and increased it ev with every year without exception until 1910. Um, and since then, there have been some small in decreases but we continue to have an imprisonment rate of uh, over 500, uh, 500 per 100,000. And when you include people who are, in, are incarcerated in our nation's jails, we now have about 1% of our adult population behind bars. Um, this is a, a similar graph for the state of Illinois. And uh, what you, you'll see here is that Illinois followed the national trend. Um, and from the, incarcerate, the increase in the incarceration rate in Illinois started back in the 1970s, but these data show that from 1980 to 2000, uh, it steadily increased every year, almost every year thereafter. And around two, in 2000, like many other states, um, incarceration rates flattened out, uh, but continued to rise nationwide because the, uh, the number of people incarcerated uh, at the federal level uh, was also increasing. So uh, it's worth going back and, and look, seeing some recent commentary on incarceration in the United States. Ten years ago, uh, Associate uh, Justice Anthony Kennedy said, our resources are misspent, our punishments too severe, our sentences too long. Ten years later, um, Eric Holder uh, said, pretty much the same thing, telling us that we have too many people go to too many prison, prisons for far too long for no good law enforcement reason. 250 years ago, uh, Cesar Beccaria made the, the pointed, made the point that it is better to prevent crime than punish them. This is an admonition which uh, at least for the last 30 or 40 years, most of our policymakers have been ignoring. Um, uh, and, uh, and we now know that there are ways of preventing crime. You want me to get you? Okay, yeah, so I can see this. Yeah. Of, of, uh, pre of preventing crime so we don't have to punish them. Uh, we now know that early childhood development programs can be decisive in this regard. And, and, this, and an important person who's really been making this point is Jim Heckman at the University of Chicago, but uh, others have made it be prior to Jim doing that. We also know that things like drug treatment programs can have the same effect and reentry programs. But I'm here today not to talk about these kinds of issues. Uh, as, um, as Art pointed out, I've done a lot of work on early childhood development programs. But I want to address a more specific question of can we, can we prevent both crime and imprisonment by better spending the resources that we commit to the criminal justice system? Uh, and currently, we, as a country, we spend over $230 billion a year in the criminal justice system. And, uh, and there's an allocation of it. Uh, about $75 billion goes to corrections, and about $105 billion to uh, policing and the rest to 
to the running of the courts. Um, and so, in this talk, I want to talk uh, today, tonight. I want to talk about the work I've done on the question of can we spend this money in a better way. And in fact, uh, I wrote in 2009. I wrote an, an essay with uh, Stephen Durloff, uh, who's an economist at the Uni University of Wisconsin, on. And the title of the essay was, Imprisonment and Crime Can Both Be Reduced? And our answer to that question was, yes, they can be reduced, both be reduced. But it's, where it's going to require an abandoning of severity-based uh, uh, sanction policies uh, in favor of policies making more effective use of police. Um, and so in particular, we argue that there should be a shift in resources from corrections to policing, and in an era now of declining budgets for, um, in, uh, for all things, including the running of the criminal justice system, that in this era, that the police should get a bigger share of, uh, policing should get a bigger share of a smaller pie. So let me make just a couple of comments about uh, imprisonment and crime prevention. Raise the microphone. Sorry, okay. And then that microphone too. That, okay, so, okay, I'll stay over there. Uh, is about the different ways in which um, uh, imprisonment can prevent crime because it's, it's, it's central to the, some of the arguments that Stephen and I have advanced and I've advanced since then on my own. And one, it's important to draw a distinction between general deterrence, which is about the effect of the threat of punishment on crime and what criminologists call specific deterrence. And this is an important distinction because what criminologists call specific deterrence is something that comes in the aftermath of the failure of general deterrence. Because it's about the impact of the experience of punishment on reoffending subsequently. And that can only happen if the person was initially uh, not, not deterred. Um, at the same time uh, that Stephen and I wrote this essay on imprisonment and crime, I wrote uh, another essay with Frank Cullen and uh, Cheryl Johnson of the University of Cincinnati in which we did a review of the evidence uh, uh, on specific deterrence, which we titled um, Imprisonment and Reoffending. And the conclusion of that review, which appeared in um, Crime and Justice, uh, uh, which Mike Connery is a protege of Norville uh, uh, edits, was first of all that the research on this question of how the experience of imprisonment on reoffending, that it was generally not of very good quality, but that near, nearly all of it has concluded that there's either no effect or a criminogenic effect of the effect of, of actually experiencing punishment. And then uh, this is, a, I think, an important quote from our essay is, that while we concluded that the evidence was not sufficiently firm to guide policy, it does call into question wild claims that imprisonment has some strong specific deterrent effect. That there's no evidence that the experience of imprisonment having a chastening effect on, 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 on reoffending. Um, so, um, and then finally, um, another uh, way that uh, imprisonment might affect uh, reduced crime rate is through incapacitation. And I would argue that for the last 30 to 40 years um, that our nation's policy uh, of sending more and more people to prison and warehousing them there has been ba basically driven by uh, this idea that somehow that we can reduce crime effectively by incapacitation. And it's important to draw a distinction between uh, policies that are simply incapacitating people, locking them up and, and keeping them away from society, and there's, there's an important difference between uh, deterrence and incapacitation. Because crime control by incapacitation necessarily requires larger prison populations. So you're reducing cr crime by sending ever more people to prison. Whereas crime control by deterrence offers the prospect of lower crime rates and lower imprisonment rates because if crime is prevented by deterrence, then there is nobody to punish. Um, 
And then I just remind you to remember the admonition of Cesar Beccaria that it's better to prevent crime than punish them. So two key ideas in, that, in fact, go back also to Cesar Beccaria and Jeremy Bentham are concepts of the deterrence are the severity of punishment. And in the context of prison, that means we're referring to sentence length. And also to the certainty of punishment and in the context of imprisonment. We're talking, therefore, about the probability of imprisonment. And there have been two types of studies of the effect of imprisonment uh, on crime, which I have reviewed. One are regression-based studies that relate the imprisonment rate to the crime rate. And the other are policy evaluations of sentencing severity. Um, as it turns out, is the first type of study uh, has, to my mind, received mo far too much attention, and, 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 and far less attention has been given to what the policy evaluation studies have shown on sentencing severity. This is, I'm gonna, uh, in the interest of, uh, of time, I'm gonna run past the talk. Of, I'm not going to go uh, off on why I think these studies of, the, of imprisonment rates and crime rates are not useful for answering any are not helpful in answering any useful question. Um, instead, I want to talk about uh, studies of sentencing severity and what they've concluded. And the, and the studies of sentencing severity have addressed such questions as, does the California three strikes law deter crime? Does the threat of harsher penalties once you reach the age of majority, juveniles, when juveniles go from being juveniles to adults, does that affect their offending rate? Do um, interventions like uh, Project Exile, which threaten more severe penalties for weapon violence, do they deter? And then, uh, and then 70 era studies of, uh, gun, uh, of gun sentence uh, enhancements. And the conclusion when you look at this literature is as, is as follows, is that at best, they find not modest deterrent effects, but they find, mostly find no apparent deterrent effect. And so the conclusion of this study is that increasing what we have of already, the United States already has far longer sentences than any other, any other country in the Western world, that increasing these sentences does not have any material deterrent effect. <coughs> I'll just make a, a couple of, of, of important of side comments on the issue of lengthy prison sentences and incapacitation. Is, first of all, it's important for us to recognize, or, and I think people in this room know, that high rate offenders are a very small fraction of the total um, uh, offender population. And therefore, sentencing policies like we've had like which I think, for example, the, three, the, the California's three strikes law is emblematic of, are very, very blunt and inefficient ways of trying to identify and isolate the small fraction of high rate offenders. Um, another important point is that we know is that age is the best cure uh, for crime. Uh, and what our sentencing policies have done uh, over the last 30 years, which increasingly rely on sending more people to pr prison for very long times, is that we're turning our prisons into old age homes. Um, so let me move now to an another uh, topic that has been part of this, the topic of police and deterrence, um, is that there is very good evidence um, uh, that large changes in police numbers affect crime rates. That is, large downward reductions in, uh, in, in police numbers result, or presence, result in increased crime, whereas large increases in police presence reduces crime. Uh, to me, this is not particularly surprising. Uh, an example of the latter is, just quickly, so you have a sense of the studies that have been done here, is that during uh, high terror alerts, the number of police on the mall, national mall, are routinely doubled. And every time that happens, there's a big drop in crime rate in the, on the mall and, and, and around it. But another important uh, way in which the police can prevent crime is um, 
is by the way they are mobilized and utilized. And so there's lots of evidence that concentrating police uh, 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 at, uh, at hot spots, crime hot spots, reduces crime. That is one, and one of the most important uh, empirical regularities that Larry Sherman and colleagues identified more than 20 years ago, that even in high crime rate neighborhoods, the crime tends to be concentrated at a few small locations, like problem bars and so forth, and that by focusing police presence at those locations, you can prevent crime. And that and then, then there have been various sorts of a, a variety of studies showing that what's sometimes called problem-oriented policing tactics can also be effective in reducing crime. And an example is a study that was done by my, uh, my colleague at Carnegie Mellon, Jacqueline Cohen, and Jens Ludwig, who's at the University of Chicago now, that they did a study of problem-oriented policing in Pittsburgh, which was specifically designed to reduce gun violence in, in, in Pittsburgh, and they found that that mobilization was actually was quite effective in Pittsburgh. So let me bring this back now to, to, uh, to ideas from deterrence and, uh, and uh, talk a little bit about the ideas of certainty of punishment and deterrence. The, the conventional wisdom is that, the cer that certainty is a more effective uh, 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 is a more effective deterrent than severity. Um, uh, is an important caveat is that for that to be the case, there has to be some consequence that's associated with being caught and detected. But all the evidence shows that in, in the United States that we're well beyond the point uh, of making, to make, to, make, to make certainty work that we have to make the severity of the consequences greater. Um, as I said, this conclusion is consistent with research findings on the severity of, uh, of deterrent effects, that there's, there doesn't seem to be much of a, a severity effect. But it's important, now I want to make an important point, uh, which, which ultimately relates to mandatory minimum sentencing, among others, things. is it important to keep in mind that certainty is the product of a, change of a, a chain of events beginning with the apprehension and then ending in punishment. Uh, and that, getting back to my point uh, about policing, that the police are the first actors in this chain of events. Um, so here's a, a graph showing that, just to make my point, is that uh, somebody commits a crime, then there's apprehension, and P of A is the chances, the probability of being apprehended. Once you're apprehended, uh, that there's a there's a, there's a conviction that occurs, so there's a chance of conviction given apprehension. And then finally, if you're convicted, there's a chance of imprisonment given you're apprehended uh, uh, and, and convicted. And going back, to the, this, going back to this chain of events is that we have, as I described, good evidence uh, that, uh, uh, that apprehension risk can deter crime. If the, that is, uh, apprehension risk can, can uh, commit crime. We have no evidence, actually, there's no evidence out there on whether there's a deterrent effect of heightening conviction given apprehension. And finally, if we ask the question, what does, is there a deterrent effect of imprisonment, of increasing imprisonment given apprehension and, and conviction is the evidence simply doesn't support that increasing that risk, for example, via mandatory minimums, has a deterrent effect. And I think part of the problem, the reason is, if, particularly if you've once committed a serious crime, like a felony, the chances of imprisonment given conviction are already very high. Um, um, and it's also very distant. And so, As I said, there's only good evidence of the deterrent effect of the certainty of apprehension. And there is no substantial e evidence of the deterrent effect of mandating harsh, harsh uh, sa uh, sanctions post apprehension. And thus, an important point in a recent essay, another crime and justice essay I wrote for Mike Tonry, is that is that the, about this certainty principle, it is that it is the certainty of apprehension, not uh, the certainty of imprisonment that is the effective deterrent. Uh, 
Uh, you repeat the question. The question was, is, is this uh, independent of crime type? Which, which, are you referring to the certainty of apprehension? Yeah, each of those factors. You know, well, what, the, what is, the is, is that there's substantial evidence that the certainty of uh, that police presence can reduce a, 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 a wide variety of crimes, um, um, and particularly, um, and the issues that the studies that have been done of the certainty of severity of punishment are of the sorts that I listed before. So there's not it's not like it's systematically gone gone across different crimes, but these studies of severity not deterring have are, have been done over a pretty wide variety of contexts. Okay. So what the policy implications of this are is that criminal justice oriented solutions to crime problems should focus on the question, how can the police, uh, what can the, the police do to prevent crimes from happening in the first place? Um, and that putting more people in prison should be a last, not the first resort uh, to crime control. Um, and in, um, in, in, in my essay, the essay I described previously in Crime and Justice, I distinguish two roles of uh, the police. One is their role as apprehension agents, and that's just catching people and arresting them and, and putting them in, you know, moving them into the criminal justice system. And then another I describe as sentinels, and, 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 and that the best evidence of deterrent effects of policing has to do uh, with them operating in this so-called sentinel role. Um, um, so um, it's not to say that apprehension is not important, but it's, uh, it's important to keep in mind that when police apprehend or are, are in the mode of apprehending people, it's after deterrence has failed because they've committed a crime. And we want to stop them from committing a crime in the first place. And that Finally, um, and I, maybe some of the speakers who, uh, after this who are going to talk about policing, is it's very important in, in when police are operating in this sentinel role is that they respect the civil rights of citizens and, and do things and behave in a fashion that doesn't uh, jeopardize police legitimacy. And I think that all we've seen happening in New York City over stop and frisk is, and the, the, and the controversy that surrounds that is an object lesson in this final point. But let me stop here and, and let others. Thank you. Thank you.